So Jordan, welcome. Welcome to the In The Making Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem, man. Um, so I, I think uh, I'd like to just start by letting you kind of explain what you do, who you are, and, and uh, in, in your own words. Cool. Yeah, so I'm uh, currently the VP of Sales for um, an authorized dealer for TELUS. Our name is Smart Haven Security. I've been doing it only for about a year now. Uh, my background's in sales, specifically door-to-door sales, so direct sales. Uh, I'm actually originally from Montreal, Quebec, and it all started because I flew out in a plane. Some guy told me I'd make a lot of money going door-to-door. I flew out to knock doors in Calgary for a summer to sell alarm systems. I got my teeth kicked in the first couple of weeks. I had no money. I was stranded out there, so I just kind of had to succeed, but that's kind of how it started, and that's kind of what I do now, so. For anyone listening, basically, Jordan and I went to Dawson College together. Um, and out of uh, anyone who, who obviously has been to high school or university, you know that uh, you lose touch with most people. Uh, a lot of them end up becoming degenerates. And uh, <laughs> and then there's always those one, one, or one to three people that you kind of just, you may not talk that much, but you kind of keep an eye on social media um and you you can see other people are up to some big things and i i feel that i don't know i hope but i don't know if you feel the same way about me um but uh i've kind of been keeping an eye on jordan and basically one of the the biggest things that made me realize like this was a right the right call to bring you on was i saw you post your um your 2021 goals on instagram and i was like yo this is putting my goals to shame like i yeah like i didn't even make Very my goals detailed. yet and um, and I saw this list and I was just like, this is this is so key. Um, and then I spent like an hour writing my list out. And uh, I mean, you put it on social, so I'm guessing it's okay to like dive into the numbers and stuff there, with yeah. whatever you're comfortable with, obviously. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, let, let's just get started with like how you. Obviously, a lot of people do sales um nowadays i feel like sales at a tech company is like the latest thing to go into after you finish your business degree um so let's start with kind of like where you started with everyone else and and how did you move up how did you move up how quickly did you move up uh and when did you realize like you could take this to the next level yeah no that's a great question so for me it started off i was actually uh working at a call center Back in Montreal, we were selling lead generation over the phone and I was just an appointment setter. And I remember I'd call so many people and I just hated it because I would probably make the most calls, book the most appointments, but there was no commissions involved. So I was getting paid a salary. I realized that I had more value. So one of my buddies in the US, he tried to get me to work with him selling alarm systems for this company called Vivint. I couldn't get a visa. So they flew me out to Calgary. And I didn't want to go alone. So I asked two of my best friends to come with me. I said, Hey, John made a hundred grand in like four months. You guys should come do it too. We could all do it. It's easy. So we jump on a plane. We fly out to Calgary. We land, you know, like Alberta is known for like home of the, the rednecks. And we get out of this plane. The guy that picks us up, his name is Blaine Emelson. Um, if you're watching, I'm sorry to throw you under the bus. He comes in, he's, he's in this truck. He has this big beard, bald guy. And I'm just like, and he's just like, how are you, bud? Um, but yeah, he picks us up. We're skeptical because we're just like, what kind of scam is this? He drives us yeah. to this hotel. It's actually a nice hotel. And then there's this conference room. And there's about 40 of us, about 40, 18 to 25 year olds just sitting there. And they all look lost. So by then I'm like, hey, I'm comfortable with the fact that I'm, I'm with all these other lost people. So I still remember my first day. Um, you know, like the first day he gives this motivating speech. And we're young, we're like dumb, and we just listen to everything we say, they say. So we're just, we're like, wow, like I'm pumped. I'm going to sell a hundred today, right? No one sells a hundred in a day, but he drives us in his car to an area. I remember he gives us a uniform. He gives us a notepad. We had contracts that were like 10 pages long. And he drives an hour north of Calgary called this little city called Cochrane, Alberta. And I still remember he opens the door for me. He says, you ready? I was like, nope. And I'm like, what do I say, Blaine? I don't know what to say. And he's like, you'll figure it out. He slams the door and he just drives off. And I'm just like, what am I doing? So I go and I knock my first door and I still remember it. This lady answers the door and she's just like, what do you want? And I'm just, I'm frozen. 
I'm literally frozen. My mouth freezes and I'm stuck. And I think she realized she scared me. So she was just like, are you okay, son? And I was, <laughs> I still couldn't talk. So by then she realized I was just an idiot. She slammed the door in my face. So that was like my first day on the job. I realized that it was like really hard, but Monday, no sale. Tuesday, no sale. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, no sale. Saturday, we work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. just because there's more people home. Yep. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., no sale. I call my buddies that went, that came with me. I was like, hey, guys, what are you guys doing? One's sitting in a Tim Hortons, literally doing nothing. The other one's sitting in a park, right? And they're like, why did you get us to do this job? This is the worst. I have a question. Did they fly you yeah. out or you flew yourselves out? So the company flew us out. They gave us like a $300 just 300 bucks for travel pay. But once we get there, it's like sink or swim. It's a hundred percent commission. So if we don't make any money, we're just like, we have nothing. Yeah. But it's 9 PM. I find myself sitting in this park bench and I'm like crying because like I haven't sold yet. And like, I'm a grown man in this park. There's kids running around. I'm crying. It's weird. Right. And I see like, it's dark out by then. I see this one house, the light was on and I still remember it. Like it was 9.15. I didn't get picked up yet. I was like, I might as well knock one more door. And this lovely couple comes out. There's, their names are Ashley and Simon. I still remember their names. And they were like, are you with Vivint? I was like, yeah, that's, that's me. And they're like, we just had a break-in last week. We want to sign up. Oh. And, I first, <laughs> and I was just like, you know, the commissions back then for those alarms was like $600 a sale. Yeah. So like, I remember I made that first sale. My hands were shaking. I was sweating. But my friends saw me do it and they're like, oh crap, if Jordan can do it, we can do it. And then that was just how it started. That was my first week. And then, you know, one week of that, second week, same thing, Monday, Tuesday, Friday, all the way till Saturday, no sale, 9, 9 15 p.m. on the last Saturday, got a sale. And then every single week, I'd always sell at least five accounts, five sales every week for the next like five years. So, so that was my wow. first year. That was, that was my first year. That's how so, I got right into it. That's who, just, just one second. That's crazy because we, we door to door for our business. We actually just had our first day today for the season. And nice. we are always, always say like, you know, whenever you're about to quit, just do one more. And it's always like that last door of the day or like, like, oh, you want to quit. You want to quit. It's like eight o'clock and you're like, fuck, whatever. I'll just do one more. And you go do that one more and always you get right when you need it and to it's continue. Never, it's you never get it. even like, like, just like, oh, you made a small, it's always like a crazy, like, like, oh, I have a map, I have a deck, I have windows, yeah. I have everything yeah. that you do. I need done. It's like yeah. five times the average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You always, but like, I, I just think it's crazy because I know that we've joked about it and always talked about it and it's crazy that you're saying it now too like like i was down and out the last one i was like i'll just go to one more and boom you got it and that's a catchy going it's and crazy. can i i, I want to ask you said um you'll average like five accounts a week does that mean that you're basically doing like you did day one where you're grinding a whole day each day of the week to make one sale yeah for the first two weeks yeah i i yeah. It sucks, right? Because you never know when that sale is going to come. It's like the law of averages. So some weeks, it might be you sell zero from Monday to Friday, and then Saturday you sell five. Wow. So that was, and, and were you, um, I don't, uh, I mean, I, I feel like I remember, but I'll ask you your, your perception is, do you feel like you were, um, I guess, like a, a typical salesperson before start? Like, were you outgoing and enthusiastic and confident before you started this? I think naturally uh, I'm like an introvert naturally. Um, once I'm comfortable around people, then I, I start becoming like an extrovert. Like I'm, I'm fr like I could, I could be talkative. I'll, I'm confident around people I'm comfortable with, but I was never comfortable around strangers and stuff. So I don't think I was naturally a, a salesperson. So you kind of have to step out of your role a little bit to uh, <laughs> knock yeah. on people's doors. So, uh, so that was your first year. Um, and then, what was, what was the average and what did you end up clearing in that year? So my first year I made about 45, uh, it was, and it's not by year. So we worked just for four months. My first four months, I made $45,000, um, at yeah. 20 years old. Like that's, that's a lot of money and yeah. at the end of the summer, my managers approached me and they said, Hey, you're really good at this. We think you have the potential to go out there, recruit people. They gave me this like you know, recruiting pitch. Yeah, yeah, they sold you. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. different from the others. You're different from the others, yeah. <laughs> but I, I genuinely felt like it, it changed my life, not just yeah. financially, but being able to, 
you know, overcome adversity and, and be mm. able to adapt to the fear of failure, right? And overcome that. So when I overcame that, I truly believed that it was a good program to be a part of. And that's when I said, you know what, like, what am I going to lose from asking my friends to come? And what are they going to lose by knocking doors? Yeah. So I decided to go back to Montreal and I ended up recruiting a bunch more people, brought them back out west. And then that's when my second summer, I was an assistant manager. Um, I had 12 bodies. We weren't a big team, but we, had, we were 40 total. And then I had 12 bodies directly under me in that team of 40. Did you feel like when you, um, when you brought all those people out, did you um, did you find like a lot of people came out there just because they heard that you made so much money and they ended up flopping versus, or did everyone just do well and that was it? So the one thing I've learned, um, at least the reason why I really liked the company I was at, I feel like they had very good values. Um, the, my mentor that taught me almost everything I know when he taught me how to recruit, he told me to recruit people not on the money, but on the experience. Yeah. That way you never cause that expectation to be like, oh shoot, I didn't make as much money as he said I did. I have a, it was a terrible experience. It's more like they come out there knowing they're gonna fail, mm. but they're gonna learn. Yeah. And then when they go out learning, like going out there to just fail, they end up making money anyway. So money yeah. becomes like the byproduct of the experience. 100%. So I, I don't feel like any of them, I, like actually I could call any of them up right now and I'm very certain that not one of them would have regretted that decision to come knock doors with even if they didn't make their financial goals i feel like that's a big that's great. um like something i learned along the way was when you start when you when you tell people about the money um and then they show up for the money it's like people hear about a lot of money or a business that makes a lot of money and they they're so tied to the money that they show up and they like they work for a day and they're like okay the money's coming and then after like three or four days they're like Okay, I came here for the money. I don't have the money. So now I have to like sit in purgatory for like six months or a year, however many years it make, takes to be successful before I see that money. And you're like left without a purpose. And then you either have to, you know, do some soul searching or basically give up and move on. So yeah. um, I think I that totally like, I think that you. like selling people on like, like just to use your example, like $45,000. Um, but like, each sale is $600. Like for somebody who's not in the business, like it's hard to see $600 turning into 45 K in four months. You know what I'm saying? They're like, geez, I made 600 bucks this week. How the hell am I going to make 45 K? That doesn't make any sense. You know? So, um, yeah, I, I really like the idea of selling people more on the experience. That's, uh, that's good. So I'll add to that. One of the, um, I think one of the other reasons as well, and you brought it up actually, Dan, we put people in a situation where it's just sink or swim, right? Yeah, They'll fly yeah. out to Calgary it's, you know, a six hour, five hour flight. Mm. It's not as easy if I was like knocking doors in Montreal with my friends. You could just and quit whenever one you want. doesn't have a good day, they could just jump right onto that bus and then mm. go back home. Where this is like, yeah. it's such a hard thing to just, okay, now I gotta book my flight. Now I gotta, right? So when you're a quitter somewhere far, it's, it's so much easier to have no distractions, right? Mm. I feel like also when you're, like it's all about your environment. Like when you're surrounded by people that are just like everybody's grinding, you're looking around and you're like, am I really going to be that guy who books a flight yeah. home? And like, yeah, if yeah your, exactly. thresh your threshold for bullshit and failure just like tremendously goes up. And honestly, that was like one of the things that I really envied about what you were doing when I heard about it. Cause I was like, man, this is crazy. Like we have a very similar, uh, you know, the business model is different, but student works painting was very similar. You know, you take a bunch of university students, you've never done anything. You promise them that they're going to make a bunch of money and learn how to run a business. Um, and a ton of them just end up like dropping because they give up or their parents start telling them, you know, you're not getting paid for this. You should, you should stop and focus on school. And their friends are like, why aren't you partying on Saturday night? Like, come on, let's go out. And they give up. And, um, and it, it's, you know, who knows, had they been stuck in another country or another city and they didn't have a choice, maybe, maybe a larger percentage of them would have made it. So, um, and you guys, you had whole, uh, tell us about like the regime. Cause I know you had like a daily schedule that was like fucking intense between working out that, and eating <clears throat> breakfast. And, and that's that schedule for the reason why it works. I, I truly believe, um, when we were, it's, it's different now, but it's, it's similar. We'd have 
every single day it would be 12 p.m. We'd have something called a correlation meeting. That's when we would all get together. We'd have a meeting. We'd go over our goals from the previous day so we could hold each other accountable. And then we go over our goal for today. And it's like, it's very energetic. So we're sitting there. Most of us are guys. There's probably three girls in the office, 37 guys. And it's a lot of hoorah. So we'll be like, like, Jordan, what are you selling today? And then it'll be like one. And then everyone in the, in the room claps one, right? Then the next person, I'll do two. And then they do two clap, right? And then I'll do three. Someone does a three clap, right? So it's like every time someone sells, we're writing it down on this goal board. And you never want to say something that you can't achieve. So yeah. there's a lot of energy in that room. So we'll do that. We'll go for goals and then our... Um, accountability from the previous day and then we'll go over some training for the new day and some of the managers at least I'm, and I'm truly grateful for the managers I had my first year they were so talented at sales mm. right like my manager his name is Blaine Emelson he was like, like a god at Vivint he he's the like guy that picked you up in the truck yeah he, he was <laughs> like he would sell 380 alarms in one summer and the average was like 100 so he was doing these. And what, like, it, what is that like, like dollar wise? What it 380 times 600 average? Well, the crazy part is that a manager pay scale because he's a manager. He's, he's getting, getting higher commissions. Close to eight to nine hundred dollars to thousand dollars a deal. Jeez. Right. Yeah. So a lot of my managers were clearing wow. that quarter million in the summer mark. Yeah. Right. And then wow. he was very good at the sales technique. And then I had another manager that was just very motivating. His name was John Whitten. He knew how to like get in our heads to make us like past these obstacles that are in our heads so that when we go out there we just fully work Mm -hmm. after that we do this crazy cheer at the end of it um we literally go in a circle it ends up being a crazy mosh pit we get the energy going then we (laughs) jump in the car and then we drive out to area around 2 p.m from 2 p.m to 9 sometimes 10 sometimes 11 sometimes 12 p.m 12 in like a.m we're just out there you're knocking on you're knocking on doors at midnight who's how are people responding to that? The 11 p.m. We're not yeah. knocking at midnight. Sometimes we just get left at midnight. So like, okay, okay, the manager okay. drives the car, but the manager also knocks. So sometimes, like, if I get in a house at like 11, I'll be in there until 12. Sometimes. Yeah, because you're making the sale. Middle, oh, because you're making because you you do the entire sale at the door. It's true. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. We we do everything from like, you know, sign them up to the full closing process, yeah. and we install it the same night as well. That's the crazy part. Okay, so that makes a lot more sense then. Okay, okay, wow. So everything is same day. You book a job, the guys come, they install it, or do you install it yourself? We don't install it ourselves. So when okay. we're out in an area, we'll we'll be like in a huge area. There'll be like you know seven or eight technicians in their car with equipment waiting to install it right, right. away. Wow. Right. So they're just they're just they're banking expensive. on you guys all hitting your goals. <laughs> we we hit our well. It's it's that idea of like buyer's remorse, right? Yeah. You sign them up, they have, you know, 24 hours to how long thinking about them canceling, right? This way they don't cancel. They have the product in their hands. They're looking at it right away. They're ready to go. Look, yeah. I've, I've left crazy. the house. The latest I've left the house is at two in the morning. Jesus Christ. Really? Yeah. And they're happy that? with their system. They loved it. To them, they were like, wow, you stayed here till two. Yeah, they morning. love it. They and love it. I re- I'll never forget when That's we, incredible. we used to go door to door and I would be like, I, I'll never forget the first, the biggest sale I ever made was in, I think it was in my like, I don't, I think it was in my first year. Yeah, it was definitely in my first year. And I was like, our average job size was like 1500 bucks. Uh, and you know, you're clearing like, if you manage your profits well, after everything, we're clearing like 30% of that, 35%. And, uh, and one night I went out and I like, I had this appointment for like, whatever like a medium-sized job uh and i go there at like eight o'clock and it ends up going into like a three hour like i'm doing their whole house their backyard every and they're offering me dinner and uh i end up leaving there at like like three hours later what is that eight to nine so at 11 o'clock and uh and i closed it was the first time i'd ever closed a 10k deal and like uh, and you're getting like a check on the spot like there's no like i'll think about it it's like it's 10 grand pay me and they're like here's a check and um and i'm like rolling down the window and i just start screaming like singing to like kanye west lyrics um <laughs> like like out of my window like i fucking did it <laughs> um so that's like that's a high that you can never uh I, i've never had anything like it honestly when you make yeah. a sale like that yeah yeah. So, um, Jordan, so, so you, you started there, you were out in Calgary. So bring us 
from there, bring us to now, bring us to like where you are now. How did you get from, from that guy who was getting dropped off in the, in the, in the middle of the streets, you know, maybe until 11 or 2 AM to where you are now? Yeah. Well, I won't go into detail because there's so much. Yeah, 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 for sure. Surface level. <laughs> so, like I, I actually quit. I tried to do my own thing. Actually, that's that's when I bumped into Dan again. I quit Vivint. I wanted to start something new in Montreal with a different company, mm -hmm. and I completely failed at it. Like it, like I did so bad. Um, but I learned so much in the opportunity just leaving and running my own it was more of my own business this time than just being a door-to-door -door sales representative because i had to handle the technicians the hiring the marketing so the what about it what, if, what at what point did you say like i'm done with this like what what made you realize maybe i should give up on this and move on to something else well i don't think i guess I, like i failed is the wrong word i think um in, in the alarm industry it's a recruiting battle every day Right? So once you make your name up there, almost every single person in every alarm company knows who you are. Yeah. And I was I, like, I wasn't the best, but my name was known. So every single day I'm dealing with another recruiter trying to get me to join them. And when I, the, the day I remember I was done was I got a phone call from one of my buddies, his name is Rahul. And he was working at Vivint. I was still at Fluent in Montreal. Yeah. And he called me and he, we had just this like a three hour, like real conversation. And it had, had nothing to do about money. But he talked to me for three hours about how much he wants to grow his business. And he just sold me on him. And I was just like, you know, this is the kind of guy I want to work with. So that's amazing. Like, Good for you, by the way, because yeah, I, I was feel like, like, how do I get a switch? How do I switch without like, and bring all my team with me without, you know, like doing it discreetly. Cause it's, it's hard, right? It, there's a lot of law and stuff involved and, yeah. like, with no one competes and everything. I feel like, um, like there's like a common thing with, with, entrepreneurs too where i've come into contact with a lot of people that are doing their own thing and deep down like i really want them to come and work with us not because i'm like trying to grow my empire but just because i truly believe that we will both be better off with us combining and some very few people see it and they're like you know what you're right let's do it but most I find can't get out of their own way with ego. And they're like, I can't leave it because I built this and I need to be in charge of what I'm doing. And, yeah. and they just, they stay where they are and they kind of plateau. Yeah. I think that's where like, I, I was like the opposite of that. I just, <clears throat> I was always open to opportunity. Like I would yeah. never shut my ears off to someone that had an opportunity. For sure. Cause I was curious. I'd always try things. And I think that's where, it was the year I, like, I saw you again. That's when I was like, I learned the most. So when I went back to Vivint right after that year, I just went in on fire. I had my best year because um, I had like a bad year at Vivint. And then like, and it's not bad. It's just like not as much as I wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, when I went back after I failed at the other company, by the end of 2019, that's when I started reevaluating my goals again. Because, mm -hmm. you know, being in door to door for five years, I was like, do I want to do this that much longer? Yeah, because yeah. it's no, there's no longevity, right? Like you do it for a year, you make, you cash out, but then if you leave, you don't have anything after. Well, yeah, and in the industry, like everyone's goal when they go into like alarms and door to door is eventually become that regional manager where you yeah. have multiple teams and you don't have to knock anymore. Mm. But that's when I was like exploring other options, and a buddy of mine, he told me to try doing lead generation with him because he was crushing it. Um, he actually has, you know, Russell Brunson. Yeah. Yeah. So Russell Brunson's actually one of his clients. Is he, he the one the that does he run like door to door con? Is that him? No. Russell Brunson. He's the owner of ClickFunnels. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So the owner of ClickFunnels, which is the company that does literally the programs yeah. for all the marketing, they yeah. do their marketing through my buddy. And wow. so like when That's my so buddy fun, uses huh? him as credibility, <laughs> he, he lands so many clients. Right. So he was like, Hey, I'll do the marketing. You just find me clients, Jordan, I'll pay you. I was like, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So I dropped off the door to door thing. I was like, I'm going to actually start my own business with this guy. And I failed at it. <laughs> Literally again, my second business I'm failing at because it was February of 2020 COVID hit and the businesses I was trying to call were going under because, <laughs> yeah. you know, obviously with the pandemic. So this was like in between your, like you did four months 
selling alarms and then you had a break and you jumped into another business, right? Yeah, I get, I get bored. Yeah. Like, cause when we work four months, we take like eight months off and that's when I like to explore. Yeah. Um, but you're also like, you're used to such a, like a heavy grind that I feel yeah. like it's a common, like people that don't know the hustle are like, yeah, I just want to like make millions and then retire and you're like i would i would rather like i mean i would kill myself if i had nothing to do all day and i just had nothing i'm almost like i'm in i have i'm in a quarantine right now i want to kill myself man <laughs> yeah, yeah you don't blame me but yeah because I, I get it though it's like you, I just, you just need to work so um but yeah that company failed and that's when i got reached out by uh adt they're a telus dealer yeah it's this guy his name is grant's amazing guy and He's actually been trying to recruit me for like five years. And for once I was like, you know what, let me just do it on the side while I sell, you know, marketing. Yeah. Mm. But I was, I was going out door to door, didn't close for some reason. And I realized um, when Telus bought ADT, the pricing went down by so much. And that's when I realized it was easier to sell. When I realized it was easier to sell, I realized I could recruit more people that would be successful at it. Yeah. And I was thinking, I was like, why don't I just jump into this thing and why, why do this marketing thing? I was still getting paid by Vivint because Vivint, they pay me residual. Mm. I didn't quit yet. So as long but, as you're with them, you're making residual on all of your sales? Yes. I make residual with them because I was planning to go back in the summer, right? Okay. And keep the marketing thing as my side so, gig. So just to confirm earlier, yeah. let's say, let's say you're making 600 bucks on an average sale. Are you, you're making 600 bucks like cash right there. And then you're making like, the residual the third, off like, the like 10 bucks a month okay. every year forever and as long as you're with the company as long as they keep the system so how vivid did it um and the commission went up almost like a hundred dollars every year so by my last year it was going up to like a thousand yeah. nine hundred because i was like a manager mm. but um they would pay you half of it up front and then half of it in october right okay so in october you get like this it's called a back end check it's like yeah. christmas because they like, want you to yeah, stay yeah. until the like until the $50, end. Fifty thousand dollar paycheck and like mm. one paycheck. Yeah, right? we know about that. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was one source of it. That's why I like Vivint. You'd have that as one source of income. Then you make overrides. So off my team, I would make like anywhere from eighty to one hundred sixty dollars in overrides every time they sell, mm. and then I'd make residual. So if my team sold like eight hundred accounts that summer, I would make about a dollar and twenty cents for every account, right? Wow. And that would get added accumulatively every year. And we signed five-year contracts, so those customers are paying us every year. So, like, it wasn't that crazy, but it was, like, I was making close to around 2000 and residual every single month Jeez, um, wow. over, like, the last, over the five years of, like, building. And do you residual. keep that if you leave the business? Yeah, you, you lose it when you leave. Okay. Um, and then the other sources, they'd actually give you equity, and that's what was cool at Vivid. They'd give you equity in the company. Oh, wow. And mm. last year, they went public, right? So everyone that had equity, wow. finally, they have shares. And that's where like, wow. when I made that switch from Vivint to Telus, it was like a hard thing to do because I had equity that I was leaving, I had residual that I was leaving, right? Did, were you able to sell your shares? They, they all already gone public? No, like I lose, I lose everything when I, when I left. But did, had they gone public already? They did, they were about to, like they, they announced the IPO, they went public, but they don't, they didn't give like the shares right away to the employees. Yeah. We bought it as something called, um, I can't figure out the name. You gotta hold on to it for like a year or something. Yeah. 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 Like 18 months before we could take it out, right? But yeah, so there's a lot of it like riding on my decision back in February because mm. I had the marketing thing that failed. I had Vivint that was still paying me with the equity, but I jumped into this Telus thing. And when I jumped into it, the dealer only had 30 reps. But I really liked the owner because like he would he would listen to my ideas. He'd be like, Hey, what do you think is a good idea to recruit people? Hey, what do you think is a good pay that we could give to the reps? So after switching, I ended up creating and redesigning like the whole platform and program for the company. So I made new pay scales and how we like the compensation plans. I made like a, a summer season that will work, um, like the plan for the summer of where we're going to go. And then after that, I just went to recruiting and this is where everything changed. It was like March of 2020. Vivint Canada shut down. So there was over 400 employees, like talented sales reps that were out of work. Because of COVID? And, sorry? Because of COVID? Because of COVID, right? Wow. And the American dollar was so high. They're an American company. They shut down. And that's where it was like, 
all these representatives running around looking for a company to work for. Yeah, I bet. And they're like, oh, let's, I, I have Fluent here. I have Liberty Alarm here. I have other ADT dealers. And then I have Jordan working at Smart Haven. And I think one of the biggest things I've done in the five years of my, like my career was build good relationships with people. So a lot of them just came to me and, you know, we started off 30 reps. We were 50 reps by like, you know, J uh, June. And then by July, we were like 80 reps. Um, August, we were like 200 reps. And then by October, we were almost 300 representatives. Uh, and so, so did you recruit from most, 30 to 300? Did you recruit like most of them? Months. Did you recruit most of them? So I, I didn't directly recruit most of them. I recruited, I recruited probably like eight, like 70 to 80 of them. And then a lot of the, the representatives that worked with me, like, um, so a lot of the guys at Vivint, they basically got visas to go to the US, but there was a lot of representatives that didn't hit the threshold of their income. So mm -hmm. they're like the lower performing reps. They came in and worked with me and they ended up becoming like my highest performing reps and they became my managers. And then I basically like helped them recruit their teams. And now, you know, from one team of 30 reps, now we're nine teams with, with 300 yeah. representatives. Wow. So, so do you, what's your, um, I guess, what's your like big picture play here? Cause obviously it's, it sounds like it's like, there's an owner, but you've come in to help him. Obviously you've had a significant impact on his business. So how are you, I guess, I mean, obviously you want to provide value, but how are you also looking out for yourself so that like you don't end up in another situation where you spend two, three, four years building something for somebody else. And then you walk away and, and you don't have anything. No, that's, that's a really good question. I, and I think that that's where, you know, just like in anything, there's not, there's never really any like certainty, right? Um, just like Vivint, it shut down. We had some guys making millions of dollars a year and, you know, it just shuts down like that, right? Mm. Um, but what I'm doing for me, and I think the best thing I can do is just build as much value as I can, right? For the owner so that he could see that with the value I'm building that I'm worth it to the company, right? Yeah. At the same time, it's also building those relationships with my team. And I think that's what's also important, right? I want to build a team that's so loyal to me that if I leave, they follow me wherever I go, right? So that's why sometimes I'll go on a trip to Costa Rica. I flew out 12, 12 reps to Costa Rica, right? And, you know, it costs me money. It, it, and some people think of, it, think of it as stupid, but I think of it as it's a long-term investment of me building relationships with some of the team, right? So if I leave somewhere, they come work with me, right? And it's not like I'm, I'm doing it actively to make them like yeah. stick with me, but it's just, it's the, the most important thing about my job and the most enjoyable thing is building those relationships and mm, having right. close people with me, right? I, I just wanted to kind of uh, shift gears for a bit because I know uh, that you've been doing something which I really want to make sure we touch on the podcast. I, I feel like a lot of people, and I'm, I'm sure you'll both agree with me, a lot of people have kind of been using um, COVID as an ex a bit of an excuse um to not really uh you know un to underperform we'll say you know a lot of people have been using the fact that there's a pandemic to like in, in in your case door to door like oh well we can't really go door to door you know there's nothing we can do let's just wait till this ends kind of thing it's gone on a long time now it's a bit crazy but i know that um you uh actually have tested positive for covid and you've kind of not let that slow you down at all so i just really wanted you to kind of uh comment and, and talk a little bit about that yeah yeah, no, I think you're right. A lot of people are using it as an excuse. And like, um, at least for me, like my opinions and my values and my political views and stuff like that, like I feel like we just live in a world where people just love excuses. Yeah. And we're almost, they're almost forced to, right? I don't think it's their fault. You know, when we're, we're giving out CERB or CURB to like totally people, this, we're almost yeah. feeding them like, hey, don't work, yeah. right? So like, I, I get that mentality. Um, I just never grew up like that. I never liked taking handouts. I never liked, you know, taking money from anyone growing up. So I think COVID is an amazing way to make money. I think it's the reason, not the main reason, but it was a turning point for my business. If COVID didn't mess up my other business, I would have never switched to this company. And timing is everything, mm. right? And then the other thing was for door to door, if you think about it, what's one of the hardest things in door to door? not catching people home. Yeah. Yeah. Where was everyone during COVID? They were oh, at home. We, we so it's totally more like, yeah, I hear you, man. We, we, we totally felt that. That was, yeah. Yeah, that was exactly it for us. And the crazy thing was they had, like, I felt like they almost 
were they were more willing to spend money. I feel like when people were home, they were in a buying mood. Yeah. yeah. Because when people are home and they're not doing anything, and this goes for anybody, the the most time you spend money is when you're not making money. Because you yep. have all that free time to spend money. Yeah. So people are home, they're shopping online. I never thought about looking that. looking on Amazon. Yeah. And then some handsome fellow knocks their door to sell them an alarm system. Right? <laughs> they're like, of course I'm going to buy, right? Yeah. And then the other thing was, so that's just on the sales side. So sales were good, but how about the recruiting side? How about all those university students that had summer job plans? No job. Right? No. They don't no have job. work anymore. So that was another source of recruiting, Right. I would reach out to a lot of like of my friends that lost their job and I was able to provide them work yeah. and then their friends would do it and then their friends would do it. And then, you know, that was just my door to door team. But then I was like, before that I was able to create a work from home team as well, where we were doing cold calls from home, you know, hmm. and who doesn't want to work from home. Right. So yeah. I just call someone and say, Hey, do you want to work from home? They say, yeah, they'll say yes. And then another recruit. So I built oh. the recruiting side and the sales side just from COVID. I, um, well, that's a great way to, it's great. <laughs> I heard, um, I was actually, I never go on LinkedIn and I went online today to like make a post and I saw, um, I saw a post from uh, midday squares that was like the biggest lesson we got was, uh, through COVID was to like, when everybody else is going on defense, like make sure you go on offense. Um, and, um, a friend's brother of mine, uh, who's still doing student painting called me up in the beginning of COVID last year. And he was like, how is this impacting you? Like, I feel like everything's going down the drain and like, we have to stop working. And I said, you know, and this was before I knew anything about it. Like, I didn't know that it was gonna impact us in a, in a good or bad way. I said, historically, any of the stories that I've read about, you know, billionaires or tycoons or, or anyone that's really super, like really just, just like killed it financially, it's often people that are doing the opposite of what everybody else does in a financial crash, whether it's, you know, buying all the real estate when, when there's a depression um, or shorting the market or, or whatever it is. So I said, you know, I have two choices here. I can go the route that most people are going, which is I can feel sorry for myself and I can let it get to me that I can't go in and work and I can get depressed about it. Um, and then I'll be left with nothing. And I'll be afraid the whole time that I'll basically make no money and, and I'll lose because of it. Or I can go and choose to work and figure out ways and grind my ass off and maybe people will judge me for it. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that will go, oh, you should stay home because of COVID and you shouldn't obviously be safe, but, but still, um, there's a lot of people that just feed into the negativity and either way, I'm going to be afraid that of something, either I'm afraid people are judging me or I'm afraid I'm not making money and I'm losing. But at least if I take a proactive approach and I go and do shit, there's a, a, a huge potential upside. And we, you know, we figured out exactly what you did, which was, uh, and I, and I know a lot of other business owners that did too, which is, you know, you, you keep pushing at it and you'll pivot and, it may not work the way you think it's going to work, but COVID for a lot of businesses has forced them to um, restructure their admin to figure out how to build an e-commerce platform that they never did. I mean, I know I've been watching you on Instagram and like you're, you're fucking selling alarms over the phone through ads to people that have never met you. And that's a whole other business avenue that we may have never discovered had COVID not happened. Yeah. So you know, you got to, you got to, you got to decide, like, do I, do I want to make my own luck or do I want to sit at home and be sad about it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, uh, it, it, it's interesting, right? Because a lot of these businesses, they already knew that these online, you know, strategies were there, but a lot of them were just so ignorant into it. Right. And it, COVID allowed them to yeah. start actually looking into it when they should have. And I think it's a lesson for a lot of businesses, um, just they have to be able to adapt to you know the economy well you're busy being busy right and like i feel i feel like um like gary v when uh like when he talks about stuff like this he's like um uh, one of the questions that he was asked was what do you do when you spend all like like six seven eight months building your your platform on instagram or facebook or 
or whatever. And then that, that platform dies. And he's like, that's the market. Like, what are you going to do? That, so fucking what? Like that, sure, you should be prepared doing other things, but like, <laughs> there, there's no reason to feel bad about it because that's just how it is. Mm. And um, like, I know a lot of realtors that were just so like some of the top realtors in the, in the city that, you know, these guys are making millions of dollars a year. And, uh, and they were just so busy that they didn't even have time to organize their business. And like you said, because COVID forces them to stop, now they're like, let me check these blind spots that I thought were not really big deals in my business. And they're reorganizing all of their systems and building out their website. And, and now they're going back to work and they're like, fuck, like we should have just stopped the business like two years ago and done this. Like I, we didn't think it was a big deal, but now that we're doing it, we're realizing how important it was. So mm. there was, there was a lot of good that I think came out of it. Cool. Um, so I'd actually like to jump in a little bit. You, you, like Dan mentioned earlier, you posted your goals on, uh, on Instagram. Um, so I want to kind of jump into a couple of the things that I saw in there. Um, firstly being, you have a goal this year of hiring 500 employees, which is, yes. that's, that's an inc incredible amount. Um, and so Dan and I are, are also currently looking to hire door to door sales reps um, so I was just hoping to get from you, like as somebody who's going to be hiring probably, uh, like, I mean, like 490 more reps than we are. Um, Isn't there 500? so I want, we're at 300. I want to get to 500. You want to get to 500. Okay, cool, cool. So 200. So, um, what's something like, what do you look for in your hires? I know earlier you said you, you sell them. I think maybe it was before we started the episode, actually. You said you sell them more on the experience than on the dollar amount. Um, but yeah, so like other, other than that, like what are you really looking for when you're making these hires for, for door to door reps? Yeah. So it, it just depends. Um, like, are you guys the direct recruiters or do you have people recruiting? for? We're you? doing it all direct recruiters. So that's where, um, the first thing would be find people that re could recruit for you so okay. that you can recruit more. So do you and use an recruit. agency? Not necessarily like, not like an agency, but I just mean, at least the way that my business works is like, depending on like when, when other people recruit other people, mm -hmm. there's incentives for that. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah. So we, don't, we incentivize them to like recruit. And if you guys aren't doing that, find a way to incentivize your teams to recruit that way they can do it as well. Like okay. a, re a referral bonus. Basically, if you get a, a friend bonus. to work here, then we give you a thousand bucks type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And then obviously finding out the goals of the main representatives that work for you. Right. Because there's a huge, like, there's so much to recruiting. That's very important outside of your business, outside of my business, just in general. Hmm. Right. So when I was like, if you read that book by Simon Sinek, like start with why yep. um, and, and you hear about like um, Steve jobs and how he was able to like basically recruit people to work for him for free. Yeah. And that's why I like the idea of not selling people on the money. If you could recruit someone because they like your vision, you're basically recruiting them to work for you for free. Yeah. Right? I have guys coming out to knock doors, make zero dollars, right? Until yeah. they make a sale. And then if you could express that to your teams that, hey, like recruiting is important. If you could just learn how to recruit, not for the money, but so that you could take that skill set outside of this anyways, mm. you could build big things, right? Like okay. how many of your employees want to start their own business one day, right? You got to think about that. Yeah. So it's like, just give them that education that, hey, like, yeah, you might not get compensated that much on recruiting, but you'll learn so much because of recruiting. Mm. So that's the first thing, just expressing how recruiting is a good thing like for your teams. Um, second thing is teaching them how to recruit. And then the third thing, going back to what you were asking, is selling on that experience. So yeah. when I would, you know, when I would try to find people that wanted to work with me, I'd always look for those entrepreneurs. Like yeah. everyone can call themselves an entrepreneur nowadays. And I think that it's, it's I think that it's stupid. Like yeah. they, they'll they'll make a social media page, yeah. do absolutely nothing, yeah. and now they're or an influencer. They'll, they'll yeah. get like a few shirts printed on like Vista Print and be like, <laughs> yeah. I'm a clothing yeah. designer. Yeah. But those are the people you want to target, right? Like they're not bad people. I think they're just misinformed. They just need a they just need a direction. They need yeah. someone to like put them in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So those are the people I'll reach out to. Yeah. And I'll say, hey, like. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask them directly. I'll say like, what, what do you want to do? Right. 
right? What are your goals, right? Because yeah. when I'm hiring people, I'm not trying to hire people long term. Like I'm trying to hire people so that they could use this job as an, a vehicle to help them move get their where future they, goals. Get like where a, they want to go. Like yeah. a trampoline. Yeah. Exactly. And then what are what can I offer them that's not of monetary value, right? Wow. So yeah. I'll be like, hey, like Education. you might like I can't guarantee that you're gonna make thirty grand this summer. But what I can guarantee you is that you'll learn how to overcome objection. You'll learn how to overcome rejection. You'll learn how to deal with clients. Wow. Right? You'll learn yeah. those soft skills that school never teaches you. And then I'll ask I'll ask them every single time, like when I'm sitting down with a recruit and, and this is one of the biggest things I say every single time it works, I'll say, Hey, if you wanted to learn a language, right? And I'll ask them, what language do you want to learn? They're always like, I want, I want to learn Spanish. Yeah. And I'll say, if I gave you two options and I were to pay for you to go to school for four years in Spanish, or I were to pay for you to go to Spain for two years, what would you choose? And they always choose, yeah, I'll go to Spain for two years. <laughs> yeah. And Obviously. Like, yeah. Like, oh yeah, because you know, I'll get to be immersed in the culture. I'll eat the food. I'll meet the people. That's a great question. That's a you great question. You know, and then question. stuff like that. And I'll say, well, my program offers you the same thing. You're in business. One of the most fundamental skills is sales, right? Now, if you want to learn sales, would you go for school for four years and learn sales at school? Or would you rather go to a country of sales, a program where you could actually be immersed in, in sales? You're going to eat, yeah. breathe, sleep, drink sales for four months straight. You're going to be around motivated people. You're going to be around some of the most trained like people that could teach you how to sell. Right? Wow. You're going to be around people that have goals in mind. Right? You're going to be immersed in the program. When I tell that to them, they're just like, Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like it, it does yeah. make a lot. It of makes sense a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I um, wow. I really want to yeah. like, like take a moment to acknowledge what you just said, because I feel like there's this um, there's almost like a sense of entitlement right now, where it's like unless I'm like, what's an unpaid internship? Who would take that? You know, and I think a lot of that comes more from. I I can only speak to what I know with kids who have parents with money or who have things given to them mm. because it doesn't really register with them. Um, but I remember thinking, and that's not to say I was dead broke or anything. My parents did well, but by no means were my parents just like handing me like, a, you know, 500 bucks a week allowance or anything. Uh, it was like, okay, you're an adult, like go fucking work if you want to buy stuff. Um, and when I, when I uh, started university and I first heard about student painting, I was like, this is nuts. Like, you're telling me that I am not only, like first you're telling me I get to learn how to run a business, okay? I'm paying two grand a semester to learn how to run a business and nobody's taught me a goddamn thing about running a business. But you're telling me that not only are you gonna teach me that and I don't have to pay you a cent, but you're also gonna pay me? Like, this is, this is the dream. And then I would bring friends in and some of the, a lot of them worked out, but every once in a while you'd, you'd hire someone or you'd see another kid in the program and they'd just be like, yeah, like, you know, what if this doesn't work? Like, you're not going to make any money. And I'm like, why do you, why do you do anything? Like, like if you could only have the long-term uh, vision to understand the compound interest of the things that you're going to learn, like, I see a book. I like, I don't even register as books costing money. Cause I'm like 30 bucks. I get one good thing out of it. That good thing could make me a million dollars one day. So like, boom, paid for every book I've ever read in my life. And one, all you need is one thing from one book and it pays yeah. for every book you've ever read. And I'm You're still hunting. To go. I'm still yeah. learning. <laughs> still looking, still looking for that one thing. <laughs> um, cool. So uh, another thing I noticed is like in your goals, you've got like, uh, business goals, you've got fitness goals, uh, you've got spiritual goals, you've got goals for music, you have so many things, like, how do you, um, like, how's your, like, work-life balance, how do you find time to achieve all these different things that you've, that you've set out to achieve? Yeah, no, that's a really good question, um, one of my mentors, he talked to me about, um, I think, I think the book's called The Happiness Advantage by Sean Aker, yeah. okay. um, and it, well, these five pillars of, it's like five pillars of success. And in any business, like it, business is hard, whether you're a salesperson, 
whether you're you know dealing with the stresses of your employees, you mm. need to have a very strong mental game. Mm. And I think that when people lack that, everything else fails. But people lack that because of little things that happen on a daily basis, right? So let's say you're knocking doors five days a week. The first day is a good day, you know? But the second day, you know, you just don't feel well and you roll your ankle, for example, and you can't walk. And the reason why you roll your ankle, like sometimes maybe it's an accident, but a lot of times it's just because you're, it's, it doesn't have enough strength in your ankle, mm. right? You haven't exercised. There's not enough muscle built around it, right? So sometimes things, little things happen to us. Or, or let's say you get in a fight with your girlfriend, right? And you're trying to knock doors and sell, but your mind's still on that fight, right? Or you're trying to recruit someone and you're thinking about like food to eat because mm. you're not on a healthy diet, yeah. right? We lose focus sometimes because we can't get our main pillars in order, mm. right? So the way that I structure my pillars is I'll make sure mentally, spiritually, that's, that's always one of the most important ones. Financially is the next one. Emotionally is the next one. So emotionally would be like the relationships you have with your friends and your family, mm -hmm. right? Then physical would be the next one. And then intellectually, right? Um, I think that sometimes we look at success as just a financial thing. But yeah. so you could be the richest person in the world, but if you're dumb, right? Life sucks. <laughs> you know, yeah. you and you'll be... probably lose it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's that's where I feel like those five goals, once you start with the five goals, you can turn those five goals into actions, right? You, t you take those five annual goals and then it's like, okay, hey, my goal is to be 175 pounds lean. How do I break that into monthly, weekly, daily goals, mm. right? Or my goal is to, you know, learn about real estate and learn about the stock market. Then I can break that down into goals. I'll read, you know, two books a month. One book will be on finance. One book will be on real estate or one book will be on personal development. And then same thing with spiritual, right? Like I want to feel happier. Right? How can I break that into daily goals? I want to meditate. I want to, like, I, I always keep this thing. I write down 10 goals every single day, my 10 goals. Mm. And then I write down 10 things I'm grateful for every single day. Mm. My little things like that, you know. Um, and then finance as well. How am I going to, you know, uh, I want to make money, but what am I going to do with my money? How, how am I going to save money? It starts with, like, compound interest. How much money am I going to put away every day? Mm. It's investments and things like that. So yeah. um, wow. I actually... Like that's, I'm, I'm happy you brought up the 10, uh, the 10 points of gratitude. Um, because I feel like that's like, that's become like the thing now that every book talks about, write down what you're grateful for. And you know, millions of people read it. Even people that aren't in business or read personal development books, you read it and you're like, wow, this is great. Or like your yoga instructor said it and then you move on and you never, you never hear it again. But then you hear 10 other people say it. Um, so I just want to tie this back to what you said earlier about how, you know, you're having a whatever day, you roll your ankle, and then all of a sudden, you know, that fucks up your week because it just rolls into other things. So I, I'm guessing, tell me if this, this is the case, I'm guessing the, the whole point of the gratitude thing is almost to, to set your state on a positive note and do the opposite of that. And if you start off the day just thinking about good things, it's hard to be negative later on because you're already on that roll. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. There's this book called uh, Own the Days by Aubrey Marcus. And What's they it talk called? about having something called Own like a day. hard habit. Own the day. Mm. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because um, what, what he'll do is he'll, he'll have like that hard habit will be just something very, very hard, very difficult in the beginning of the day. Mm. So that all the things that are hard in the rest of the day seem yeah. easy. So like whether it be like a super cold ice shower yeah. Right. Or like a crazy run in the morning doing something that you, you don't normally do. Yeah. Um, those things in the beginning of the day are super important. I think the first two hours of your day is detrimental to like everything in your week. A hundred percent. Yeah. There's a book, uh, there's a book called, I think it's, I, I can't remember exactly where this concept is from. I think it's from getting things done. I can't remember the exact author, but it's about eating, eating the frog. And it's that exact thing. It's like you wake up every morning, you have to eat the frog, which is like the, do the hardest thing that you have to do that day first. And then, everything else is going to be like a, a breeze from there. If you can do that one hard thing as like as early as possible, everything else, the day is going to go great. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, man. And, um, man, sorry, uh, finish, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just saying that's, that's my goals, man. Like it's, um, I think it's important to just have it as separate categories. That way you can break it down. Long. For sure. 
For sure. Totally and just to you. um, just to like jump in, I know, and I'm only bringing this up because I saw that it was uh, it was on your goal list and you posted it, so I know I can talk about it. But Jordan has a goal of um, of making half a million dollars this year. Did I get that right? Yeah, five fifty. Five hundred fifty k, which is absolutely insane because I think the only two places, the only two industries. Okay, that's not true. I guess, like, if you're a lawyer or a doctor, but for the most part, in order to make that kind of money, like, you got to either be, like, number one in your field at something, or you got to be running a business, or basically, in, in, even in sales. Like, you got to be a fucking good Incredible salesman. Incredible salesman to do that, um, which I believe you are, so. <laughs> I've heard a few of your... Uh, your sales your, calls your on, sales on Instagram, pitches. yeah. It's, uh, you're, you're, you're definitely very good. We have to go back and forth one day on a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so at this point, like you've obviously had, had a great amount of success, um, in alarms, uh, you're, do you feel like you're, I feel like there's this misconception that people feel like once they get successful, it's like, check, I'm successful. I feel good about myself, but that's obviously not the case. So where do you feel you're at in terms of like your journey to where you want to go? And how good or not good do you feel about it? You know, it's, it's, it's funny. And this will be on the record because it's, I just found this out today. Um, but I, I am pretty comfortable right now. Like, you can see it on my social media. I'm on vacation. I'm like, and um, I'm just having a good time. But a lot of the leadership I look up to, you know, they've always told me, be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And I'm at that point where like, as I am getting comfortable, I'm, you know, I'm sipping on a margarita in Mexico. I'm sitting there. I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. Like it, it yeah. feels bad to be on vacation, right? Because I feel like there's more work that I have to do. And I've, I've basically implemented that hard habit in myself, in my brain. It's like, it's part of me now, right? That I always have to be working. And, um, you feel the guilt. It goes to that goal. Like the 550 K I just got presented opportunities to go work in the U S right. Yeah. And it's scary because I'd have to leave a lot of what I built behind. Right. Mm. And I have something good going for me, but like the, the risk is high, but the reward for working like it's in the U S they want me to go to Florida to sell solar. Right. And in solar, you can make close to, you know, one to $2 million a year. And that's where I'm like, should I do it or should I just stick with this? Right. So I, I'm like, not everyone knows about it. Like almost no one knows about it, but I'm in this battle right now and I'm just, mm. you know, I'm comfortable, but I could still build this thing bigger or I could go do this and make, you know, three to four times my goal. But, um, going back to that, you know, after last year, you know, I had a, I had a very good year, like from working from June until December, I made more than half of my goal that's listed there. Right. And I think that if I could do that in half the year, I think I could do that in a full year. So that's mm -hmm. why I made my goal something that's realistic. Yeah. And knowing that I have a team that, you know, I have their full support this year. Like I, I love those. I love my team. Like they believe in me. I believe in them. And the work that I see them doing is very motivating for me. Right. I'm sitting here, I'm on vacation and these guys are still calling every single day clients. Mm -hmm. I have this WhatsApp group where it, we basically like once someone sells, we see it because they post it up. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in Mexico and I'm just like, ding, 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 ding. And at the same time, it's like paycheck, paycheck, paycheck for me. I'm just like, I feel terrible taking this yeah. money. I, yeah. I need to be working because I also don't want to be that person that is at the top and comfortable. And I yeah. want to be a leader, right? I don't want to just, you know, be that guy that people turn to when they need things done. I want people to see me doing things as well. For sure. That's why I've lately been on Instagram. I feel like, you know, when you're working, like there's two things, there's working when no one's watching. And I think that's obviously more important. Mm. Right. But I think nowadays we have to use social media platforms and take advantage of it. So it's like when you're working and people are watching, yeah, you're still having the same result financially wise. I already know how to work without people looking at me. But now I have the chance to let people see mm. that as well and maybe be an example, right? Um, show people that there's money to be made and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. crazy. Cool, man. Um, 
Yeah, I just had I just had a couple more questions here. Um, one of the things in your goals was you said you were thinking about uh, going back to school. So yeah. just as as somebody who's like obviously <laughs> doing, doing quite well for himself and and pretty successful, my my biggest question is just why why would you ever do that to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> that honestly that that shook me when I saw yeah, that. Yeah, I was, I was like, like, whoa! What? Why would you ever think of that? Yeah. Did it say maybe go back to school or just go back to school? Uh, you wrote maybe. I can't remember. I think it but said you maybe. Consi- but you I think it was. It. I think it said be. I think it said be open to the idea yeah. of going back to school. And I was just like, as somebody who's like would never be open to that, I was just like, wow, this guy's <laughs> already successful and he's open to going back to school. You, that seems crazy to me. Did you finish though? Did you do? Did you do your undergrad? I did one year at Concordia. I failed like most of my courses and then I dropped out. Well, that's okay. You, you also, Pat also took a year off and, and then yeah. when we started this business, he was like, fuck, I have one semester left. I got to go do. Yeah. I finished. I went, I went back after that and finished, but yeah, now that I, now that I'm out and I'm actually doing things like I, I could, I don't know if I could ever go back. So, <laughs> so just to, to add on to Pat's question, do you feel, maybe this will help specify the answer. Do you want to be, as you said, your wording, do you want to be open to the idea of maybe going back because you just don't like the seeing yourself as someone who's closed off to things or do you genuinely see value in going back? I, I, I see value of going to school. I, I think there is value to it. I think um, having a degree is good too. And that, that, I think another thing for me is like eventually I want to have a family and like I don't think I could push my kids to get a degree if I don't have one. Mm, yeah the other thing is i want to make my parents proud and they want me to have a degree so it's a mix of a lot of like exterior motivators like in the background yeah um but i i truly believe like when i say school by the way that's not like it doesn't mean undergrad right mm. it could mean like get my real estate license okay oh, okay okay okay, yeah. okay right so like i just want to get more education i guess okay cool. which is which is very interesting because admirable yeah um i feel like as like for people that are in business, especially entrepreneurs, there's like a very strong correlation, like a, what is it? Opposite correlation or negative correlation there. There's a clear distinction between like people that are running their own business and hating school. And it's like the school system is built to basically create workers. Like I think the, the history behind schooling was basically to indoctrinate people into you know, becoming better workers for the industrialization age. I could be totally wrong about this, but I, that's what I read <laughs> somewhere uh, in a book. Do not, and, do not quote him on any of this. <laughs> I'm not responding. This do is not, not investment advice. Yeah, do, um, do not quote him on but, any um, of this. But basically, we also, I find, it's similar, it sounds like you are, and, and me too, we're so interested in learning and reading and going to like, you know, Grant Cardone or Tony Robbins or whatever these courses are. And it's like school just isn't school in the sense of it, you know, like at, like bachelors and undergrad and high school are like so not made for what we want, but we're so hungry for the right education. Yeah. I think school is also a good place to network. That's, that's another thing. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely true as well. Yeah. Definitely well, true. I found honestly school humbled me. Like I, I went into my first year of undergrad, and uh, you know I was like it's worn off. I sense. was like whatever. Like humble. It was honestly off. it was it was sick. <laughs> it was sick. It was a lot of fun. Um, but we did. I did my first year, and then I started running a business. And after that, it was like it was very difficult for me to go to class and even to like respect my peers because. I was kind of stuck with this chip on my shoulder where anything I did, any group project I was in, I was always looking around and I was like, like, I'm the only one here running a real business. Like, why am I, why am I listening to this teacher? Why am I like in this group project with this? Like, why do I even care? And then in my last year, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do the case competitions where like you're, you're put in groups with other students that are all really smart. And basically you're, you're competing against other schools. In my case, it was, uh, to build out like entrepreneurship cases and, and basically pitch a business to hypothetical investors. And I remember going in and there were so many people that were like so much smarter than me in terms of like analysis and, and public speaking and being able to just like build out PowerPoint softwares. And I was like, yo, like, like I'm not, I'm not nearly as smart as I thought I was. 
And after that, I, I kind of, I was like, okay, like, I'm really not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I feel the same way. That's why I think, um, I think it would be fun to take the skill set that I've learned outside yeah. and to apply it. And take it, take it into university, yeah. Or, or another kind of school. You're right? not forcing it, right? Like, mm-hmm. if you're, I feel like if you're there for the right reasons, like, anyone I knew who was in school because they, like, their parents didn't care, but they were like, you know, I, I worked all summer to pay my for my tuition because I want to become a lawyer or because, you know, I really want to get my business degree. Mm-hmm. Those were always the kids that, like, they were so happy studying and they wanted to be there every day. And you're just like, I was, I was just not having it. Um, so I think if you're there for the right reasons, um, then, then that, that just lets you do well in anything. I wanted to um, hop into another topic. And uh, as we said earlier, obviously, use, use your discretion for whatever you want to talk about. Um, but I know you've been in a, in a serious relationship for the last uh, three years. Uh, obviously, you've been you know, moving around, doing all kinds of stuff. You've had financial success. Um, and now you're basically, you, you went and you traveled, you're stuck at home quarantining. Um, and, and as a, a dog owner, I can also have empathy for the fact that you no longer have the dog. Um, where, where is your head at now for anyone else who's obviously been through like a really intense breakup? And what, what's kind of your, your mental game plan each day of how are you dealing with it? Well, first, I don't think I dealt with it well. I jumped on a plane and um, went to Costa Rica for three weeks, three and a half weeks, and then I got back quarantined and I was depressed, so I left for Mexico as soon as my quarantine was over. And then I stayed in Mexico for like two and a half weeks. And then, um, but yeah, now that I'm back home, I think I'm actually finally processing it. Um, not that I'm like, I'm, I am grateful I had the opportunity to travel and stuff, but how am I dealing with it? I think just day by day, like with time it heals. I think everyone knows that. Um, and I think it's a lesson for me, to be honest, like, um, it's very easy to take relationships for granted. And we just sometimes put, especially like for business owners, people that are, you know, entrepreneurs, you almost, your love is like the business, you know, it's like your first love almost. Yeah. And we sometimes don't see everything else. And that's why I really try to focus on those five pillars this year more than ever, because I feel like last year I had that on balance, right? I was working almost every single day, like, and I would wake up at six in the morning to, to get my goals down, prepare my trainings for the meeting, run the meeting, go out and knock, deal with issues, deal with drama that happens in the office. I'd be up at like up until 2 a.m. almost every night. And then I get up at 6 a.m. And I did that for almost, I think, like six months straight. And it took a toll on me. But I know for myself, I could take it because my goals are so, like, imprinted in my head. Like, I want to hit my financial goals so hard. I want to build my business so hard. It doesn't matter. But sometimes we focus so hard on that goal that the things around us start to kind of fall yeah. apart. And I think that's yeah. where... And you chose uh, that life, right? Like that's, you, yeah, you're, 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 you that. want that. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, you didn't get buy-in first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. But it, it does take a toll on, on your relationships. Right. And, um, and I don't, I don't, I'm not saying like for everyone to choose that life, like as in just focus on work. If they don't follow, you don't fall. Like if you're with someone that makes you happy, they deserve just as much balance as your work does, I think. And I think I did a bad job at it. And I think I know for next time that I need to do better at it. Wow, so, that's, that's really, uh, yeah. really big, really big of you to, um, to admit that. Uh, I think like, I know that in your, in your goals, again, you had stated that, uh, you wanted to, to learn to be alone and happy, which I guess kind of touches on that a bit. But also I think that that is something that a lot of people are wanting to, to work on. Uh, be, just because of COVID and everything, everybody's like kind of locked down or like being a lot, even if you are being social, you're being a lot less social than you have been, you know, in the past. Um, so I think a lot of people are kind of having to press pause and like stop and be like, and be comfortable just with being alone or being just you and one other person kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, I think that that's, uh, that's a good thing that everybody kind of needs to, needs to work on a bit. I agree. Yeah, 
like fortunately i've i've had i hadn't had to deal with the effects of covid right away yeah i was always around like a crap ton of sales representatives and they were like mm-hmm. my family and i was always around my girl my ex so like i was never alone so this is the first time in i think probably like like ever to be honest <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like and i grew up with two brothers too right so i'm yeah. always around people yeah but I, I think it is very important that i've learned to be happy alone and i think that's where you know goals and all those things that are very important gratitude lists for sure being busy, right? i would i i totally totally agree with you all right man well um where um did you have more yeah i actually i wanted to ask you um because i feel like this is this is kind of like personally i kind of struggle with the we called the podcast in the making for a reason. And, um, I feel like since I was, since a very young age, I've always had these like massive goals and not really specific goals. Like, you know, I'm going to build the best computer company or whatever, but it was always like, I always felt like one day I would be like so intense about what I did that I would own buildings and, you know, have hundreds of employees and do all kinds of crazy things like that. Um, and on a micro level, I go through my day to day business and I'm like, so thankful and like proud of what we've accomplished. And I'm like, Oh my God, our business is, is it like over a thousand clients? Like this is, this is way bigger than I ever thought I would have been. But then I'm also like, you know, thinking about what's next. And I'm like, but you know, like, there's no reason we couldn't do like $500 million one day. And maybe, maybe I'm thinking too small. And I'm always kind of like teetering on that balance of like being present and also like thinking about what else is out there. Um, and I know I've gone on kind of a rant here that had no really linear path. Um, (laughs) but I guess where I, where I'm going with this is I want to ask like, where do you feel you're at in terms of success and where you want to go versus where you are now and what helps you stay keep a level head um in order to like go about your day to day um and and not be constantly thinking about like what else is out there yeah um that's a really good question man for me personally, I, I feel like I haven't, I haven't hit success yet. I guess success is, is defined differently by everyone, obviously, right? So yeah. for me, I think, I think financially I, I'm successful. I think financially I'm successful for my age. I could be more successful. How old are you now? I'm 27. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think emotionally I'm wow. immature. <laughs> um, I need to work on that. I think mentally, spiritually, I need to find myself. Like, I think there's a lot of reasons why I wouldn't consider myself successful. Um, but you'll, you'll see like some of the most successful people, they don't even think they're successful. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. Uh, you always kind of want more. Yeah. Kind of like what you were saying is what what else is out there. But I I think I've, I've had a lot of success. I don't think I'm successful if if that answers it. And then the other, the other question, I guess, um, how do I stay level headed? when you know that there might be other opportunities out there. Um, again, it's just going back to your, your goals, right? Like, you know, today I, I jumped off a phone call where I was talking about a whole other industry going to the U S right. Mm. And then I opened my book again and it says sell 300 personal alarm systems, get the company to 15,000 units. Right. And I look at that and I'm like, okay, these, these are my goals. Right. So mm. it's like just having it in front of you. And that's why sometimes, you know, like that goal list, sometimes you, like the gratitude list is important, but I think the goal list takes that gratitude list and then it just like ties a knot and together it's like, it gets everything set up because you know that you're working towards one goal, right? Um, yeah, no, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but I, no, I think it, to the goal list is what keeps me Yeah, I, th- I think like the key, awesome. ta- the key takeaway there is, um, is like, I would compare it to um, when, when you hear friends talk about like a girl they just met or a guy they just met, yeah. there's a key difference between like that person that's infatuated and they like met someone once and they had a great vibe and they're like, 
oh my God, like we vibed so much. Like I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this person. And you know, deep down, you're like, this is literally meaningless. Like you guys met once and it was like a random day and you got lucky. And like next week, you'll probably not think of, again of this, but you build it up in your mind because it's like the, the best possible scenario. Whereas that person that's been best friends with whoever they're dating forever, um, you know that there's a lot more like realism there and, and it's grounded. And the same thing with, with your decisions, right? Like if you're making decisions on the fly that are like, you know, today I want to get drunk and, and cheat on my girlfriend or like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to leave my company tomorrow because I think I can make twice as much money. Like all of those are very short term thinking. But mm. when you have a list of goals that you, that you made when you sat down for three hours and really thought about it and, you know, a month has passed and you still have the same goals, like that fundamentally, that's a list basically outlining like your character and who you are. And when you continue to make decisions on that path, um, you know, that's almost like it's in line with the pillars of success that you visualize in your head. And it's very difficult to go off track for what you deem as success because you know you're you're following your code right you have a system you're following it and if you do those things you can't really fault yourself for anything because you're like i i did what i wanted to do and i, I set my goals and i, I went after them um yeah. and so, i think it's good too to have people hold you accountable right like when i look at these goals like if i were to switch companies today i have 300 and like reps that you know I look up to me, you know, and I, I feel like I'd be leaving them behind and yeah, I haven't, yeah. I like one of my most, one of the goals I care the most about that's on that list is to have 25 people make over six figures in the summer. Yeah, I saw that. And that's, and that's like one of my most like important goals that I hold close yeah. to me because my values is around helping people. Right. And yeah. I feel like that's more important than me making $2 million a year, $3 million a year. Cause I feel like if I could do that, just imagine if you could make someone like if you could change someone's life for the better financially for the rest of their life and have them learn the skill set they, they could keep with them for the rest of their life, that, that person will be loyal to you. They'll look up to you. They'll be like, like they just not owe you, but they just they're like what you've done for them is going to keep them with you. For all yeah. Time. Yeah. Or at least and we hope. We hope. You hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, listen. Thank you uh, so much, Jordan, for uh, for joining us. Um, was there anything else you I wanted think it was awesome. to... Yeah, was there anything you wanted to say to, to, to sign off? Where can well, we yeah, find actually, you? Like, one first thing, it's cool that you guys are doing this podcast. Like, I love seeing stuff like this. You know, you guys... It, it, I don't know, it's cool to see. Um, well, if you don't mind me asking, why did you guys decide to start it? I'm just curious. Um, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you want me to hit this? I, let, well, I don't know. You've been, you, you, you should take a break. You're probably out of breath. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Um, well, okay, so first of all, we've been, we, Dan and I have been talking about either a podcast or making some form of content for a very long time. Um, and basically, like, the biggest catalyst was the fact that I ended up moving here uh, to work on the business with him. Uh, so, like, basically, as soon as that happened, we were like, "We're doing a podcast. Like, no matter what, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a podcast." And then I think it was just through like lots of calls and just talking and and just like going off on ideas we had, we kind of came up with this uh, this idea for this podcast where we wanted to uh, both like do two things, basically track our journey of what, what we're doing and what we're creating. Um, and then at the same time, kind of also bring other people in and talk to them about their journeys, which at the same, which will, you know, share their stories, but also help us learn for how we can do things better and help everybody, you know, share it with however many people we can and help, help them kind of learn. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, we kind of just, wanted to create something like that and the other thing was just with our our business being what it is it's it's so intense for such a short period of time like i'm sure very similar to alarms like four months of the year it's like insane and then the rest of the year is kind of a lot more mellow um so like we just kind of wanted something to like sink our teeth into that wasn't work that we could kind of like have 
like essentially a creative outlet and just kind of chill and do this for more for fun on the side and uh and and see what we could do with it without having like the immense pressure of like needing it to make money like we're we're, we're okay with the money and then this is kind of just like a hobby that we do on the side so that's kind of that's kind of everything i, I mean, think yeah, do you have something to add yeah i think like just to kind of like i think everything you said was correct um but like if you really want to know like i guess like the the why like the the real emotional reason that kind of made us like click and go this needs to happen um i would say the the first thing was what pat finished with which is for me i feel like for the last four years with a similar schedule to you no sorry seven years you know you have a break you work your face off for however many months and then you're you're done and when you're training yourself and you're in the habit of just go, 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 now you're on a break and you're like, I'm looking for opportunities. And every time, every year, I would jump into something. One year, it was like getting into like trading cryptocurrency. And another year for me, it was, it was alarms. And another year, it was producing music. And it's like, every time I tried to do one of those things, um, I, I, you know, I didn't fail, but it didn't work because I was doing it for the wrong reasons. And I think to be super successful at anything, you need to be like 200% in. Like you really have to go all in. It doesn't, nothing happens overnight, nothing long-term at least. And I kept trying to do things cause I thought it would be cool. Like I would look cool or I would make money doing it. And then I just wouldn't put in the work cause I wasn't genuinely interested. So I would like go try it, I'd get bored of it. And then I'd be like, okay, I'm not going to put in the work. And then because I didn't put in the work, I didn't win at it. So this answered that. And the second thing, which I think was like the real, real deep rooted reason why we did this was running a business and doing anything where you are one of, if not the smartest person in the room, it's fucking lonely. And the whole time you're going through this, everybody's looking up to you to be this per this pillar of hope and vision and this person that we can look at to, to win. And you have to become that person for yourself because there's nobody else that you can look at who's like doing the same thing as you and, and achieving more. So um, it's really lonely and it's, and you're discouraged, but you have to power through and just put your blinders on and like, and, and do it. But, the thing that I want most in those moments of like utter despair and like, and doubt is just to have someone basically tell me that like, it's okay. And they've been through it. And like, basically just be like a, a North star of what I can move towards. And I feel like that doesn't really exist. I think very few people uh, I've had it and sounds like you've had it are lucky enough to have like a mentor that's guiding you. But once you go out on your own and you give up that mentor, like you're stuck. So this podcast was kind of our way of going, how can we like basically make it super accessible for the rest of the world of, of other people that are in our shoes to basically have access to people that might be, you know, 10 levels above where they are, where they can see, okay, this isn't just like, oh, Jordan's making all this money or like, look at this guy who built a business that's worth 50 million. Like, He's special. It's like, no, like we're really going to get into like the nitty gritties of like what it takes mentally on a daily basis. And I feel like that humanizes it so much and brings it down to earth so much um, that it's, it's so relatable that you're like, okay, like I, I no longer feel alone in what I'm doing. Boom. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's really cool. Thank, Thank you for being on this. I think uh, I think I can safe to say that this is pr probably the best, if not one of the best episodes we've recorded so far. Yeah. Let um, let uh, let the people know where they can find you. Like link your your socials, whatever. Uh, we'll put something in the description, but you can just shout them out now. Yeah, at Jordan dot Morales. Find me on Instagram. M O R A L E S. Um, Beauty. So thank you for for being open and honest and and super fucking real with us. Uh, it was awesome catching up with you, and uh, well, when, when this releases, I'm I'm very much looking forward to the feedback it gets. So anyone anyone who's um, who's listening to this episode, 
obviously we do not have sponsors yet. Um, we're not, we're not getting paid. We've, we've invested all our own money in the equipment and software and everything we need. Um, so if you did get value from this, please, 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 um, all you have to do, all we ask is you give it a five star review, uh, share it, subscribe, like it. Uh, only if you felt like whatever you platform value. you're on, just do do the thing that that platform yeah. has. YouTube, subscribe, iTunes, rate and review. You know that whole thing. And, and and just remember that like just by sharing this with somebody else that might get value from it, you might have a huge impact on their life. And it literally costs you nothing but like the tap of your finger. And it will have a huge impact on our lives. <laughs> and so we will get appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank thanks again and uh, and. That, that's that's, it. that's, that's it. it. That's the episode. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you so much, man. Hey, everybody. This is Patrick. Just checking in quickly after the episode to say thank you so much for listening or watching. We really appreciate it. We've got some super cool interviews lined up in the near future. We're very excited about them, and we think they're going to bring a lot of value to a lot of people. So make sure that you subscribe on your platform of choice. We are officially available on all major podcasting platforms and on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe there and stay tuned for more. We'll see you next time.